there's just like this American dream of home ownership. And maybe your grandma said your home is the best investment you'll ever make. But if grandma said that, that's because it's the only investment she ever made. Mm. <laughs> if you look at it very objectively as an investment, it's terrible. Welcome to the Military Money Manual Podcast, where every episode is all about achieving financial independence in the military faster than before. We believe personal finance shouldn't be boring or intimidating. Building wealth can be simple, and financial freedom is the ultimate financial goal. Now, here's your hosts, Spencer and Jamie. Hey, podcast listeners, Spencer Reese here from MilitaryMoneyManual.com. Thanks for joining us today. We have a very special guest with us, Jeremy Schneider from PersonalFinanceClub.com. He's also on Instagram at Personal Finance Club with over 400,000 followers. Jeremy shares a simple message, but effective message of personal finance and investing on his Instagram page. He's got some fantastic images that really break down complex topics and show you how you can invest and the outcomes that you can have through just spending less than you earn and investing the rest early and often usually into index funds. Today, we're going to be talking about his two rules, living below your means and investing early and often, compounding interest and the emotional side of FI. And finally, we'll cover his 90-10 rule for investing. Jeremy's got two awesome courses on his website, personalfinanceclub.com, with over six hours of content each. Index fund investing in 2022 and how to money like a millionaire. Two great courses. I've purchased both of them and I'm working my way through how to money like a millionaire right now. You can get $20 off by using the coupon code military money. So normally they're $79, but you can get $20 off and get them for $59. If you want to deep dive into index fund investing or want to see how Jeremy, who's a multimillionaire himself, manages his own money. You can buy those courses again, twenty dollars off with the coupon code Military Money through the end of 2022. That discount again is Military Money on PersonalFinanceClub.com. You can get twenty dollars off, but only until the end of 2022, December 31st, 2022. Without further ado, here's our conversation with Jeremy Schneider from PersonalFinanceClub.com. Jeremy, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Really excited to have you today. Thanks for having me, guys. It's an honor to be here. On your Instagram profile, which recently just got a blue check mark, so congrats on that. Your first line is you retired at age 36. How did you do that? Well, the word retired, I mean, it's kind of like a clickbaity attention grabbing kind of kind of headline <laughs> because it's people are like, what? But in short, because I had enough money such that my investments are likely to grow and sustain to provide for my cost of living for the rest of my life. And how I did that was, in short, I turned down a job offer from Microsoft in college. I started a company. I grew it for 11 years. I sold it at the age of 34. I worked there for two more years. And at 36, I quit my job. I sold it for $5 million. My share after taxes was about $2 million. And then my net worth had grown to closer to $3 million when I retired. I haven't had a real job in the last seven years or so. And now my net worth is closer to $4.5 million. And so part of the personal finance stuff I preach is about spending less than you make and investing the difference. And of course, there's a big windfall for me in there. But before, during, and after that, I was also spending less than I make and invest the difference because you can definitely burn through $2 million if you want to. But my number keeps going up because I'm investing well and not spending it all. So how did the personal finance club come to be? Was it something where you got bored? Have you always shared personal finance tips with people? Yeah, we were just talking before the recording about how early retirement can also lead to an existential crisis. And so when I retired at 36, for the next year, I basically did nothing. I you know, did what people maybe would dream of doing. Every day was a weekend. I would travel. I would play video games, whatever. And then a year into that or so, I felt a lack of purpose in my life, a lack of tension. I wasn't like building anything. I wasn't growing towards anything. And I really didn't want my life story to be talking to someone when I'm 70 years old and saying, oh, I sold a company when I was 34 and I've been a piece of shit since then. <laughs> uh, doesn't, doesn't really seem like a great life story. So my passion, some people love flying airplanes or skydiving or much more exciting things, but I really like helping people with personal finance, Roth IRAs, index funds, TSPs. That is my jam. I think when I can talk to someone for 30 minutes and like see this shift or rift in the future take place where now instead of being potentially broke or poor, 
later in life, they're maybe retiring early or being wealthy. That pumps me up. And so that's why I started Personal Finance Club. Okay, so you sold your company after taxes about $2 million, and now it's $4 million. So what, how long did it take? Over $4 million. So how long did it take to double your money? So yeah, that was in 2014. Now it's 2022. And so that would spend eight years or so, a little bit over eight years. And that you know doesn't include my spending out of that, of course. And basically what I did is the day that check cleared or the wire, you know, I actually have a video where I clicked to refresh my bank account and it went from 100,000, which was like my life savings up until that point to over 2 million. You know, the next day or two, I just went to Fidelity. I clicked buy on a couple index funds and just left it there. And historically, the market goes up about 10% per year. If an investment's returning 10% a year, that means it takes about seven years to double. You know, in a little microscopic view, that's basically been my experience where that's what happened. It's, it's doubled and, you know, I'm spending small enough amount that it didn't really impact that compound growth much. I love hearing an actual example of statistics that prove true, even when the market's been down a couple times in that seven years for you. But how did you know what to do with the money? Where'd you learn about personal finance? Where'd the foundation start for you? Did you have a good mentor or teacher or from your family? So early years, when I was in high school, my very first ever job, I worked at a summer camp and I made 1200 bucks for the whole summer. And my dad very cleverly knew the rules of the Roth IRA were that you can't contribute more than the annual limit, which this year is $6,000. And you also can't contribute more than your income. And so it's designed for like actual working people who are middle class or whatever. And so when I made $1,200, my dad said, hey, I'm going to gift you $1,200 and you're going to put all of this money into a Roth IRA. And then you can keep your own $1,200 that you earned because you were like a 15-year-old with a job or whatever. And so then we sat down again at Fidelity and he like showed me how to choose some mutual funds. And it's not exactly what I do anymore, but pretty close. And so I thought that this was like a typical experience for a 15 year old to start choosing mutual funds. I guess now like it's not saying that it's, <laughs> it screams like rich white privilege. Whatever. My parents weren't rich, but we were like middle class, upper middle class. And so then, you know, then I went through phases like in, in college, I like opened an E-Trade account, which was maybe like the, the Robin Hood of the day where I was like, picking random stocks. I was learning about dividends. And I get these questions asked a hundred times. Now, and I was like, yeah, I've tried that. I wouldn't recommend it. So I've like done all like the bad kinds of investing. I'm not all of them, a lot of them, I guess. And then when I like signed the deal to sell my company, I actually had like a four month period of due diligence. And I really didn't want to be one of those lottery winners who like wins the lottery, like is a garbage man, then wins the lottery and then spends all the money and then becomes a garbage man again. And so I started reading books on personal finance and investing, and they basically all say the same thing. Oh, okay, this is, this is pretty clear. And so then I've just basically been on that path ever since. Can I go back quickly to your, um, I just love this, $2 million growing to $4 million. Did you have like a withdrawal rate? It, was it something that you consciously thought of, or did you just kind of have your lifestyle and you just withdrew the money as required, or did you live off the dividends? How did it work from a, a tactical perspective? So there's this movement called FIRE, Financial Independence, Retire Early. And that one of the big rules of thumb in this movement is there's, there's a 4% safe withdrawal rate. So whatever your invested portfolio is, you can basically take 4% of that amount and even increase it for inflation every year and then be very likely to never destroy the original principle. I don't remember when I learned about that rule. I think it was after I quit my job and everything. I think that was more recently. For me, at least, the first two years I was working, and so I, was, I went from work making $36,000 a year as the CEO of my tiny tech startup to making decent six figures. And so I wasn't worried at all about safe withdrawal rates. And then what happened is over the next two years, I saw that my investments were going up faster than my six-figure salary. I was like, oh, I guess I don't need the salary anymore. And so that was like the first metric for me. It's like, oh, investments are going up faster than salary. And then I think I learned about the safe withdrawal rule of 4%. 4% of 3 million is 120,000, which means I could basically live on 120,000 a year. And I had never even spent half of that in a year. I was living on like 30,000 a year. Yeah. When, you're, when your lifestyle costs what a quarter of what your safe withdrawal rate is, then you've got a lot of margin of safety there. Yeah. In fact, like one of my challenges has been, you know, finding opportunities to convert money to happiness. I still am not just a frivolous spender. I don't really love the feeling of just burning money, but I do want to capitalize on, you know, using this tool for its purpose of helping people and being happy when I have the opportunity to. So that's kind of more of my challenge than just, you know, living below my means. 
I really like the phrase you just said there, convert money to happiness. Can you dig into that a little bit and share if someone's never thought of money in that way, what are some ways that they can make their money? Because we hear money doesn't buy happiness, but you can convert it to happiness. I really like the way you phrase that. Yeah. You know, there's so much like shame around money. It's like, oh, you're spending it wrong or spending too much or you need to save more or you have debt or whatever. And even when I talked to my friends, I'm like dating someone right now. She does not like talking about money. It's like this very like sensitive topic, but you know, it's really just a tool at the end of the day. And it's not a measure of your character and it doesn't make you a good or a bad person. It's a tool. And I think when you use that tool, it gets a little bit cerebral, but I think the whole purpose of the tool is to like live your best life to maximize your own happiness and to help as many people as possible. I think that's kind of the purpose of life. And I think that a lot of people use the tool wrong. It's like they're holding the wrong end of the hammer or whatever, you know, because they, they spend too much and then they get stressed and then they, they are worried about not being able to retire. And, you know, from the military perspective, it's a little bit different because, you know, if you stay in long enough, you, you get a government's retirement. But, you know, I know guys who have retired from the military and wish they had more money or maybe don't want to do all 20 years or whatever it is. And I know you guys are big on maybe retiring early. And so if you can use that tool wisely and meet your life goals, and I, I, you know, one of the big ones for me, I think the biggest is just freedom. You know, I don't want to have to answer to a dick boss if I don't want to. I don't want to have to like (laughs) do things I don't want to do. And so for sure, that's my primary use of this tool is my freedom. But then on top of that, when is this episode going to air? My mom might be listening and I'm flying to, <laughs> I'm flying to surprise her for her birthday on November 6th. So I think we're safe. <laughs> okay. Don't, don't tell her before then for the first, I mean, first of all, just no, she's turning 70 and like no brainer buying that ticket is of course, like a great use of money. Like I'm so happy I could just fly to Florida and surprise my mom for her birthday without even like that money is the easiest money in the world to spend. But then the hard money I spend is like, okay, do I fly first class? And for me, the answer was no. I'm like, all right, that's too much. That's like so much, like four times more money. But I did, for the first time ever, update to Economy Plus. I'm six foot four, 200 pounds. I have very long femurs. So maybe the extra four inches or whatever of leg room will, will be worth my 500 more dollars. I hope it's the beginning of something beautiful for you, Jeremy, and more comfortable travel. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. So six I, four. Oh, man. Wow. Yeah. Six four, four million dollars, and still flies Economy. Well, until, until this, this next trip, I'm flying Economy Plus. So. Economy Plus, there you go. Everybody just has the things that are, are important to them. I was doing a lot of travel over the summer in the States. I exclusively flew domestic first class because I was just tired of being part of the cattle car in the back. And it cost a little bit more, but a lot of it was free because I was travel hacking it. But that's important to me, right? Like I, like, I just like to get on the plane, get off the plane, and like not see anybody else. And for you, it's, it's not important people have different values and you can, you can use your money to support those values. Yeah. I don't know. I might be wrong. I, maybe I'll look back at my life and think I should have started buying first class sooner or whatever, but I'd rather maybe take four flights than take one first class flight. I don't know. Maybe that's my math. Yeah. I mean, would there be a dollar amount in your investment account where you'd like, okay, this is ridiculous. I'm going to upgrade. And I, and I guess it's a little bit different in the States because domestic first class doesn't really do anything. You were literally just sitting at the front of the plane. I mean, I guess the leg room is a little bit better if you're, if you're big, but internationally, yeah. it makes a difference. I know, it's nicer. It's like leg room, elbow room. You know, I, I feel like you can work up there. Like there's room to like, if I try to pull up a laptop in the economy with like six, four, you know, I'm like, I can't even get the screen open because like the guy in front of you puts the seat back and I'm like, T-Rex arms. I still, I don't know. I'm still like frugality is like in my DNA. I'm like, oh, it's just a lot of money. But I don't know, maybe if I had $10 million, I would start flying first class. We'll see. Okay, $10 million. There you go. I'll, I'll hold you to that in seven and a half years. Yeah, I know. Maybe seven years, double again, throw some more on the fire, and we're, we're there. There you go. Okay, so Jeremy, you're reading all these personal finance books. And, and actually, that's very similar to my story, where when I, after I graduated college, I was living paycheck to paycheck in the military. Once I was done with pilot training, I thought, okay, this is ridiculous. Like I have to get ahead. I have to stop living paycheck to paycheck. I read every personal finance book in the library. You know, after the first two or three, I was like, oh, they all say exactly the same thing. Yep. And is that where you got the idea for your two rules for personal finance? And maybe you should, you should share with the listeners what your two rules for personal finance are. Yeah, so I basically have two rules to build wealth. Rule number one is live below your means. That means spend less money than you make. You make half a million dollars a year and you spend half a million dollars a year you are broke. You have zero at the end of the year. Whereas if you make 60,000 and you spend 40,000, then you have saved 20,000. And that leads us to rule number two, which is invest early and often. If you're investing, if you're making 60, spending 40 and investing 20,000 a year, 
you will easily be a multimillionaire over the course of your career, well into the millions of dollars. But if you just save it, you won't. You know, saving 20,000 years, $200,000 over 10 years, $800,000 over 40 years, you know, you probably wouldn't get to a million. And, and then, of course, there's the cost of inflation and stuff like that. But investing would be, you know, three or four or five million. So spend less than you make, invest the difference. Those are the two rules. And yeah, you're right. Like all the books say the same thing. But the, the crazy thing is like everyone who's read three personal finance books knows this dirty little not so secret. But if you're just a 19 year old kid in the military, you know, you hear all sorts of stuff, you know, F-150 leases and insurance scams and crypto and day trading and spending all your money and consumerism and capitalism just pumping at us through marketing at all times. And so what it seems to me and probably to you guys is like kind of like corny little rules, like spend most of your money and what's the difference? I think people kind of need someone beating that drum every day, being like, no, this is still what to do. Don't get too tempted by the, the lease deal that you see on TV. Yeah, it's so simple, but not easy, right? And if it was easy, then everyone would just do it. Of course, yeah, yeah. I don't mean to be dismissive because it's not easy. It's kind of like, oh, want to be fit, diet and exercise, of course. Right. But, <laughs> you know, both these things require tons of discipline, right? You know, if you don't go and lift weights and run and everything, like eat super healthy, like that's hard to do. It's, it's not easy. It doesn't come naturally to many people. And same for living below your means. It's, you know, it's so easy to go on Amazon. It's like fun. It's like Christmas. They bring boxes to your house. But if you're looking for an apartment, it's easy just to spend more money. Like, you know, just walk into the first place you see and whatever cost it costs. It's hard to like to drive a cheaper car. It's hard to delay gratification with Amazon purchases. It's hard to be making all your meals at home versus like eating out a lot. And that's the stuff that is what caused you go from spending 60,000 to 40,000 and becoming a multimillionaire. Yeah, one thing I've always noticed, and this is especially true when I was living paycheck to paycheck, is it's so easy to spend money and it is so hard to make money. And our system, our, our American capitalist system, and this is true in other countries around the world, but all you have to do, especially on Amazon now, one click, right? You just swipe and now you've spent, you know, 20, 30, 40, 100,000 dollars. But to go and make $1,000, okay, you got to like set up a bank account. They're going to send you the check. You know, it's like this like long process. And then eventually, and you have to like actually like perform work or services or, or provide value to people. And then eventually you're going to get paid. But yeah. to spend money, like, oh, people are willing to take your money in a, in a second. <laughs> so fluid. Tap to pay. It's abstract. You don't have to get your hands dirty with the cash anymore. You don't really... It's just a number that appears on a screen. It feels very abstract. And I mean, even I'm susceptible to that. You know, like I, I walk into Chipotle. I feel like a Chipotle burrito used to be $9. I, I don't walk out of the front door 20 these days. Cause I'm like, yeah, double meat, quack, you know, whatever, <laughs> the whole thing. But like, just because I'm tapping, it's just whatever. It's one tap, but I'm spending twice as much than if I was like really trying to be frugal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, guac is always worth it, I think, so. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not saying I'm making the wrong decision, but I'm saying it just doesn't. Doesn't. There's no. There's no pain associated to it. It's so easy to spend the money. But yeah, I'm. I'm not maybe the first class, but I'm definitely past guac. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That's guac. Fi. Good to know. I think good, we just created good, a new yeah, level. Guac, yeah. Guac fi. Yeah, guac fi. <laughs> You're like, it's right about ramen fi or whatever. When you were like hustling and working on your company, building up your company for 12 years, were you implementing your two rules during that time? Or were you just living frugally, living below your means, and then kind of ignoring the investing piece and just your investment was, was your time that you were spending working on your company? I was, you know, the first two years, my company made very little money, not enough to even support the most basic lifestyle. I think we made $14,000 top line revenue the first year minus a few thousand dollars in expenses mean I could maybe take home $10,000. And even this was back in 2003 or something. Even back then, you know, you can't survive on under $1,000 a month. At least I couldn't live in Michigan. So I was living on credit cards. And so I racked up $10,000 in credit card debt that first year. So you know, basically was surviving on $20,000 or so. And then the next year, I racked up another 2000 credit card debt. And then by the third year, I was able to pay off all my credit card debt from the income from the company. And then I basically set my income fixed at $36,000 a year. I actually never gave myself a raise. I was the lowest paid employee in my company. As I hired people, they all made more than me. But on that $36,000, I lived on less than that. I lived on about $30,000 wow. a year. And that meant I was able to max out my Roth IRA. My Roth IRA put in about $5,000 a year or whatever. Over the course of that 10 years or so, it was about $50,000. 
But then again, the market doubles every, you know, seven years or so. And so that 50,000 became about 110 or 120,000. The day before I clicked refresh on the bank account when I sold my company, my net worth was about 120,000, not counting the value of the company, just from living on less than my $36,000 take home and investing the 5,000 bucks a year. So I want to talk about your Instagram page a little bit because it's very good and very popular. Thank you. For a reason that's at Personal Finance Club. We love the graphics and we find ourselves sharing them and telling a lot of our friends about the clear and concise way you simplify the post. So sometimes Spencer screenshots them and sends them to his dad who listens to the show or every time I think he does, but they're just (laughs) so good. So how do you come up with the ideas for the graphics? Is it just questions you get and the content that everything from housing to investing, it's all just such good content? Thank you. Actually, our path, so we met in person for the first time at FinCon, that money conference a few months ago. But before that, I had come across you guys because I was looking at my website traffic logs. and I saw there was like referrals from your website. And I was like, oh, that's cool because you guys were like, you know, referencing one of my posts or something. I was like, oh, that's awesome. And you actually, I was like, there's kind of a lot of traffic too. I was like, you guys must be doing great. So yeah, thanks for that. But yeah, now the Instagram, it's basically just these little bite-sized infographics that make it really simple. How do I come up with the ideas? Yeah, just from talking to people. And I just, I don't know, I just love this stuff. And I'm driving in the shower, zoning out. You know, all these ideas occur to me. I I write them down and I try to make them really bite sized and and relatable in a world of very complex financial services. The real true path to building wealth isn't very complex. You know, it's that's why I have my two rules. That's why I make this very simple. And I think that when you can cut through all that noise, people appreciate it. So I have a quick follow up about Instagram posts. This one was, just a couple of weeks ago, and it was about housing as an investment. Got a lot of uh, comments. Right? I have it up right now, over 500 comments. Very controversial. Yeah. So I'll just read through it real quick. It's not that long, but would you be interested in an investment like this? Historically returns about 4% a year before fees. Annual expense ratio around 3%. $0 dividend yield. Transactional fee of $2,000 per purchase. Transactional fee of 6% per sale. Buying or selling takes months. Minimum investment, $100,000 or more. The value sensitive to the regional economy, subject to annual state and local tax. And then you swipe to the next round of the carousel and it's like, this is your primary home. So can you share? That's kind of a hot take, I think, to a lot of Americans. We talk about for military families, how buying a home can be a little riskier than the average American family because we get forced to move without a control of our timing. Sometimes after two years, five years, you never know when we're going to move and what the market's doing at the time. So. Where did you come up with your philosophy for housing? And what do you say to the people who were trying to troll you back after that post? (laughs) Well, yeah, anytime you talk about renting versus buying, people lose their minds in the comments, which is often why I do it. And also, like, I think I'm in good company. I don't take too much credit for being the first person to ever say, hey, your primary home ain't that good of a deal. You know, this actually was inspired by a post from J.L. Collins, who wrote The Simple Path Mm -hmm. to Wealth. Ramit Sethi is famously like, you know, I feel like there's like a long line of personal finance experts, money aficionados who are just not big fans of primary home ownership as a great investment. And the reason is because there's just like this American dream of home ownership. And maybe your grandma said your home is the best investment you'll ever make. But if grandma said that, that's because it's the only investment she ever made. Mm. <laughs> if you look at it very objectively as an investment, it's terrible. It's extremely expensive. You know, it, 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 yeah, it doesn't pay any cash. It goes up about as much as inflation every year before you count all the fees. It's like very expensive to buy and sell. It requires tons of maintenance. It's very illiquid. It, it is subject to all like these whims. Like you, you're subject to risk of leverage volatility too, like you mentioned. And so people listening right now who own a home or think home ownership is great. You know, the moral of the story isn't always rent no matter what. And of course not. The moral of the story is don't become house poor. Don't put all your eggs in this basket. Don't buy so much home that you can't invest outside of your home. Because if you do, what's going to happen is you're just going to spend 30 years paying out on your mortgage, being house poor. And then when it comes time to retire, your only asset is this house. And then you either have to sell and move and get a little bit of your money back or just keep living in poverty or whatever. The real answer is whatever you do, rent or buy, is to minimize your personal housing costs. You know, if you buy a modest home, that would be way better than renting a luxurious home. And if you rent a modest home, that'd be way better than buying a luxurious home. For sure, local markets vary. You know, sometimes, like I live in Southern California where rental prices are high, but purchase prices are insane. And so it doesn't really make sense to buy here financially. You know, obviously there's lifestyle benefits to buying if you like that. There are lifestyle benefits to renting too, of course. So when I post 
kind of controversial hot takes like this. It's just to prevent people from doing that thing where they're like, oh, I'm renting like a Moss two-bedroom apartment. I'm going to go buy a fancy four-bedroom home in a better location and like triple my cost of living. You know? I also am, am pretty agnostic towards real estate investing and even buying a primary home. I mean, I, I bought a condo once and sold it after three years and I've been renting ever since. And I love it because especially when I was in the military, when it came time to move, I just turned in my keys or you don't even have to do that anymore because a lot of the locks are electronic. So you just, <laughs> you just, you just, you just walk <laughs> you just out, walk, out the walk door. out of there and say, peace. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Speaking of your Instagram account, a lot of your content revolves around compounding interest and kind of shocking people with these huge numbers. You know, it starts like $500 a month into your Roth IRA, and then it turns into, you know, millions by the time you retire. Why do you think that resonates so well? Do, do people still need to learn about compounding interest in 2022? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, walk into any Walmart in America and ask people what their Roth IRA is, and you're going to get a pretty blank stare, I think. There's lots of facets to, to personal finance, and one's like, don't buy that coffee people don't really want to hear. You know, I also think there's not, it's not really a fair critique, you know, like I feel like buying a Starbucks isn't what is keeping people broke. I think like the big like housing and cars and how they buy food and stuff are the big things they need to move, not those like the guac or the Starbucks. But honestly, I put that a lot of times just to like tease people with curiosity because it's true. You know, if you put a few hundred bucks away a month over a long period of time, it turns into millions of dollars and it grabs attention. I mean, I think people don't realize it. You know, one stat is that if you... If you look at every 40-year period of the S&P 500, which is the 500 biggest companies in the US, it's you know, what's inside of a TSP, there's no 40-year period where you could invest 250 bucks a month and it wouldn't turn into over a million dollars. So people have this kind of misconception about the stock market that it's volatile, it's up and down, you win some, you lose some. But it's actually not true. Over any like week or month, it might be true. But over decades, it always goes up because it's a collection point of all the growth and profits of the companies of the world. So it always has to go up. There's short-term volatility built into that. But over a long period of time, like I said, 250 bucks a month has never turned into less than a million dollars. The average is like $1.9 million. The worst was like 1.2 and the best was like 3.1. So exactly where you end up, who knows, because that's the future that none of us knows. But investing early and often over a long period of time just will make you wealthy. And so it's a message I think we just keep, need to keep drumming because I think a lot of people turn on the news and they see recession headlines. They talk to their friends. They hear about crypto speculation. And that's not how people get rich. It's by investing early and often over a long period of time. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of posts on Reddit right now from young airmen and soldiers who are saying, you know, my TSP is, is, is down so much this year. Like, should I stop contributing to it? Like, what am I doing wrong? And it's just like, oh my gosh, like to be 19 or 20 years old and being able to buy the stock market 25% on sale. Yeah. Come on, man, just, just stick with it and you know, expand your time horizon. Like you've been investing for nine months. Like you right. came in, you're literally coming in at the best time. I can't yeah. remember who said it, Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger or something, but you know, the stock market is a machine that takes money from the impatient and gives it to the patient. Yeah. And that's, that's so true. And when you have index funds where you're literally buying the entire global economy, every publicly traded company, and a good diversity of bonds, it's hard to see a scenario in which you lose, right? The it's essentially a sure thing, yeah. And, and the, only, the only way you lose is if there's some sort of global economic apocalypse where we're like not doing trade anymore or something like that. And in this scenario, other assets aren't worth anything either, right? Like if, if there's no Google and there's no Amazon and there's no FedEx and there's no ExxonMobil, I promise you the money in your bank account ain't going to mean shit, right? Like, you know, what you need at that point, like we're in Mad Max, you need like oil, you need shotgun shells, you need canned goods. And I don't, you know, we don't know if that's going to happen. Like, we don't know if we're going to have that. But if it does happen, being in a more conservative investment or being in cash isn't going to help you, right? So like, you know, maybe you need, need a prepper for another episode because I'm not, I hope it doesn't happen. And, and if we do have that, I'm going to probably be one of the first punks to die because I don't have enough frozen food in my freezer or whatever. But but yeah, the point is like, yeah, when you are betting on the stocks and bonds of the world to continue to operate going forward, you're, you're going to win long term. But short term, like you said, if you're 19 and the market's down, you should be like on your knees thanking the world because you are getting a discount and you're buying more shares for at a lower price. And when the market does as it will rebound, your gains will be amplified. Yeah, love that. That's a great message that we need to get out to those young military service members and some of those old military service members too. Yeah. 
on your Instagram, what would you say your most popular content is? Oh, man. I, I do think the comparisons are popular. I make ample use of emojis. And I give two examples of people who do things slightly different. One is like just saving versus investing. So for example, there's two emojis. Let's call them Ashley and Amanda. They both make 60000 a year. Ashley saves 5% of her salary, which is about average. But Amanda saves 15%, like goes a little higher. Ashley gets like a 3% return in a high yield savings account, which is about average. Amanda gets a 10% return by putting it into an index fund. Ashley pays a fee on her investments or whatever, and Amanda doesn't because she invests in an index fund. And then if you look at that result, even though they're both kind of living similar lives, slightly different tweak decisions, Ashley ends up with like 300,000 and Amanda ends up with like 4 million. And I think when you just see these like simple comparisons, you're like, oh, okay, it's not crazy. You just got to make these little decisions and do it right. Small decisions compounded over time. Yeah. 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 So in addition to your Instagram, you also have created two courses that are pretty popular. Can you tell us a little bit about the courses and which one do you recommend people start with? You have over eight hours of content on the How to Money Like a Millionaire one, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. They're, they're both about seven or eight hours long. I think selling courses online is kind of like a uh, potentially sleazy pool in which to swim. I never really sought out to be a, an online course creator. I started this just in my retirement side hustle, or not even side hustle, my retirement passion project. And then in 2020, bored during the pandemic, I was getting the same questions over and over and over. Like, what is an index fund? How do I invest? What buttons do I click? Should I be selling when the market's down? You know, all this stuff. And so I put together a video course and I was like, all right, I just need to do a, like a matrix style brain dump to put this all out in order. I was going to give it away for free, just like I give all the other content away for free. But I was like, I don't know, people don't really value free. And if you, you charge something, they might be more willing to finish it. I could also help cover some of my expenses because I was like spending some money at this point on my hobby. So I decided to sell it for 50 bucks. You know, most courses like this are like between 300 and 5,000 people sometimes sell crazy, crazy price points. Mm -hmm. Sold for 50 bucks. That was on sale. Now it's 79 normally. Then in the first week, I sold $110,000 worth of this course. I was like, oh, dang, this might be a real business. People love it. The reviews are like crazy. We have like hundreds and hundreds of five-star reviews. Yeah, you can Google. We can't control them either. We put them on a place online where we don't have manage it. But yeah, so there's two courses. There's how, how to invest in index funds, which is basically just the simple walkthrough of investing. You know, index funds are the specific way to grasp the growth of the global markets. That's great if you don't know how to invest or you need to strengthen your understanding of investing. The other course is called How to Money Like a Millionaire, which is like all the other little stuff associated with personal finance, saving and budgeting and taxes and insurance and tracking your net worth and estate planning and wills and trusts and all that stuff. And it kind of does like the Cliff Notes version of all these other aspects of your life with Jeremy, a real millionaire who like shows you my account. Like this is what I do for each of these areas. And again, I think you know a lot of adults have a lot of that stuff figured out, but it can be nice just to strengthen your understanding. So kind of which one, you know, you can take them in either order. If you're in debt and working on getting out of debt, I'd say, hey, focus on that first. Take either neither course and focus on your debt or take the money like a millionaire, which talks about getting out of debt. If you're out of debt, want to focus on wealth creation, then maybe the index fund course. I never understand like who has $5,000 sitting around to spend on a personal finance or like investing course. It just blows my mind that these content creators can honestly like wake up in the, or look at themselves in the mirror selling something that is completely free. And I, and I understand consolidating information has value, but like you're doing where you're selling, you know, a couple courses for under a hundred dollars. Okay, sure, whatever. But like when you start getting into the thousands of dollars, unless you're, you're clicking the mouse for me to show me how to, how to invest into a Schwab index, but I don't... Even that's not worth five grand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just got a DM from someone yesterday that like was pointing to me to some... <laughs> it was, it's almost cliche. His message, he's like, hey, is this guy's, he didn't call it a course, he called it like a system or something like that. He's like, is this guy's system good? I was like, like, I don't know. He's like, I don't know. He like, he's good looking and he like, he's always flying first class for free. I was like, and he's like, and it costs $1,500 to like buy his system. I would be extraordinarily skeptical of that. I mean, like what you're saying right now, it just sounds like so cliche. It's like, oh, I saw some guy on Instagram who's like posting pictures of himself in first class, you know, but then you look at that guy's content and he's like, you know how you skip the lines of the airport? You get TSA pre-checked. <laughs> okay. Like no shit. Like we all saw that. We all saw that sign when we walked in. So yeah, I, I'm I'm also skeptical of many course creators, but like I said, I'm swimming, swimming that messy pool with them, I guess. 
So I was just about to say that's a good transition because one of the reasons why you're not sleazy is how transparent you are, which is really, I think, rare and refreshing for an online creator or, I don't know, you wouldn't consider yourself an influencer, but creator, I guess. You've shared who you donate to, how much you make through your company, even by name and dollar amount of what your salary has been. Have you gotten feedback on that? probably found you a couple years ago. And that, that was really attractive as a early follower, I think, to see so much transparency. Yeah, you know, partially, I just think it's my personality. I just don't mind sharing. I think different people have different levels of fear around sharing stuff. But also, I think I lean into it in this space because money, for whatever reason, has this like secrecy associated with it. It's like, don't ask anyone how much you make. Don't talk about whether or not you have debt. Don't, you know, you know even, even when I tell people I sold a company, like they rarely, maybe one person ever has asked me how much I sold it for. But of course, everyone wants to know, right? Like it's so <laughs> voyeuristic. And so now I've just at a dinner party when someone like asked me what I do, I just like said, I sold a company for $5 million. Now I, I'm an Instagram influencer or whatever, you know? And I, I also say influencer because I'm like, yeah, I'm an awkward, nerdy, 41-year-old white guy. I mean, you know, you just got to lean into it. How else do you describe it? Yeah, right. everyone knows I mean, what an influencer is. Right. You can say content creator or I could say I own like a financial literacy business or, I, you know, you could call it whatever you want. And to be fair, like, I don't think I'm like a traditional influencer because I don't do sponsored posts. We don't do affiliate deals. I'm not like out there like modeling bikinis or whatever. Although maybe I should. <laughs> Good money yeah. in that, I think. <laughs> yeah, not for me. I think I'd, I'd get canceled the next day. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I do just like transparency because it we don't see enough of that. And yeah, even with my course, I always say there's no secrets in the course. There's nothing in the course that you won't find elsewhere in my content. It really is just a compendium of the whole thing in A to Z format. It's not, this is the secret trading tips. Because like there really isn't that secret stuff. Like if someone's telling you the secret, instead of just using the secret, they're probably full of shit, right? Like if I, <laughs> if I knew what stocks to buy ahead of time, like I wouldn't be selling a course and I would just be like trading on that information. I'd make make a billion dollars because I'm so smart. And so it really is just an educational tool. And, you know, I like to put in context of like, you know, it's cheaper than, you know, it's like a, a fraction of the price of buying a community college credit or something like that. And you're probably going to get a lot more value out of it. Not to not community college. I'm just saying it's, you pay for education sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. I think for the right person and in the right scenario, purchasing your course could, honestly, it could change the trajectory of someone's life. And it could mean in 20 or 30 years, they're a millionaire. Whereas in the counterfactual, if they didn't buy your course and they, they didn't you know, invest the time to actually understand how to invest their money, then in 20, 30 years, they could be exactly where they, they are now and thinking, man, I wish I had just taken you know, an extra five minutes or five hours and, and a week and, and actually study that stuff. And yeah. I think the, the thing that with your course that it, that it does, and because I went through the, the how to money like a millionaire, it's just you, you filtered, right? You've taken all this information and you present it in a, in a way that people can relate to and can understand. And I really appreciate that you, you call a spade a spade, right? And some of the things that you've done, I, I saw one post where you actually went and bought a universal index life insurance policy and, and went through all the, all the lies and all the, you know, all the little hidden fees that were in there. I thought that was, I thought that was awesome. Could you, could you tell people about how you, how you did that and why you did that? Yeah. If you haven't heard of it yet, or you might've heard of it under a different name, there's this class of insurance that is permanent life insurance. And there's lots of types of insurance. And so I always like to preface this, like this isn't knocking auto insurance. This isn't knocking health insurance. It's not even knocking term life insurance if you need life insurance. But there's a special type of life insurance called permanent life insurance where the insurance companies have created this Frankenstein of a insurance product that combines a death benefit if you die for your beneficiary with this investing savings cash value portion. You know, and these are very high profit margin products for insurance companies. And so it's attracted this class of insurance salesmen who just, it's a crazy world. And, and people who know about it feel like I feel, which is, it's, I've never seen a group of people so dishonest in my entire life. Mm. You know, you, it's, you scratch your chin saying like, how much do they believe in themselves versus are they drinking the Kool-Aid or whatever? But basically they pitch this product as though, it's the superior investment and it has greater returns and there's no risk and you can be your own bank and there's no downside in it. You know, like they just go through this whole pitch and like all good scams, there's like these morsels of truth to them, but the reality is much, much worse. It's also very, very, if you ask them a question, you just get this like talking point, you know, you can't see it. And so I went on TikTok and just searched life insurance and clicked on the first TikTok that popped up and then I just bought it. I just clicked the link. I was like, all right, <laughs> 
I'm going to do it. Like, let's, let's, if it's so great, show me. And, you know, and obviously I did it with the expectation it wasn't going to be great, but I don't know, like if, if it's so good that I, if it was great, I would have stuck with it. Of course, I went through a 90 minute sales pitch with the agent's permission. I recorded the whole thing. The guy just lied to my face the entire time. It was like wow. egregious. You know, if what they're saying publicly is bad, anything is bad. Just wait till he's what they say behind closed doors, right? And then the 90 page policy arrived in the mail. I read every page of the policy and then I just broke it down. And, you know, they never talk about the fees. They, they, they pretend like there are no fees, but the bitter reality of this thing is they're not magically creating more growth than you can from the market. What they're doing is they're just being a middleman between you and the market and just siphoning fees off. You know, there's like a monthly statement fee. There's a premium fee. There's a, there's cost of insurance. There's a per unit fee. There's a cancellation fee. There's a index fee. You know, it just adds up and up. And so like for my $200 premium that I was paying, about ninety dollars was going to going to fees right off wow. the bat, and then, and then as you age, those fees increase because they keep charging you more and more for the insurance portion of that. And so, what happens when you like drag the spreadsheet down forty years later? It ends up eroding about eighty percent of your wealth. You know, instead of having two million dollars, you'd have about four hundred thousand dollars or something. That really boils my blood because, and honestly, that's four hundred thousand is actually like a best case scenario because if you stop, if you miss a payment, you stop paying, or they change the rules, or there's all sorts of ways these things can go wrong, and then you get zero. The policy just cancels, and you get zero. And like these insurance agents never talk about this stuff. Whereas if like the market's down twenty percent, you're like, okay, I'm down twenty percent temporarily. You don't lose the money though. You're like, so yeah, they're, they're dangerous, and I try to expose them, but but they also then they attack me relentlessly because the insurance agents don't like when I knock the product. <laughs> So Jeremy, you mentioned that you don't have sponsorships on your Instagram account, but I think I remember over the summer, you had an auction where you were going to auction off a sponsorship and you were going to be completely transparent with the sponsorship process and, and how it all worked. Did, did you ever go anywhere with that? I know. I said we never take sponsorships and that's, that was entirely true until I pulled my audience at one point and said, hey, do you guys want to like see the inside of a, like, a Instagram influencer sponsorship deal? And so I kind of did it as a little bit of a stunt. And so I posted an auction for a dollar and just was basically like, any companies who want to bid on this, go nuts. And the winning bid was $10,500. And so it was, it was thankfully by a company called You Need a Budget, YNAB, which is a product I had personally used for and still use for seven years. By the way, well, I have no continuing relationship with them. They, you know, anything I say at this point is without conflict of interest. But I just wanted to like, kind of try and some light on like how these things work. And I made content for them. I talked about, did it change my perspective? And you know, if you're an insurance agent selling a commissioned product, you have this massive conflict of interest, which is you're just going to try to get people to buy your insurance product. If you're an influencer getting paid by a company, yeah, it does, it does like work into your psyche. And so I felt some obligation to, you know, if people ask me what the best budgeting app was, while it was true that the only one that I'd ever used, or at least paid for was, was YNAB, I felt some obligation to like, recommend it, you know, and I, and I think as that is further in my rear view mirror, I feel less of the obligation, you know, it's obviously still true that I use that like it, but I said, hey, if you don't want to pay for it, don't, there's free options too, you know. So yeah, that was just, it was just like one little stunt we did. And it was really great. I mean, YNAB was a great company, it's really great to work for. But I, I didn't really like it. I don't really like saying things because other people want me to say them, you know? And also, I do, I do think it like cannibalizes your audience a little bit. The whole, our whole business model is we just only post good, authentic, helpful stuff for free. We just want it to be like giving, 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 giving all the time. And then when you're like, when you put up ads and you're asking for stuff, then your audience kind of loses engagement. Mm, that's a good point. We're actually going to have Jesse Meekum, the founder of YNAB, on an episode, and we're recording with him later this week. Oh, that's amazing. I was on his podcast. It's one of my favorite interviews I did because I was, for me, like I'm a fan of him and his podcast and his product. And he's like a really cool, nice guy. Great product. He gave me $10,500. So I at least like him $10,500. I still pay <laughs> I still pay for my YNAB subscription. I, I didn't get a free YNAB subscription somehow. Maybe I can like but I almost don't want to. You should have written that into the contract. I know, but I do, I do feel like that it's like... That's a free subscription for like, well, 100 years? <laughs> yeah, $10, exactly. $10, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Although I don't get all that money. It goes to charities and, and my employees and all that stuff. But, um, nice. Yeah. Nice. I take, I'll take the $10,000 over the free subscription. Jeremy, w one topic that you talked about on your Instagram the other day was being frugal versus being cheap. Can you explain the difference in your mind between those two terms? 
Yeah, I think frugal gets kind of a bad rap. You know, if someone uses a coupon on a first date or something, I don't know. But <laughs> I, 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 I think I would. I don't know. Maybe, no, actually, I probably wouldn't now because I don't really, I'm not really into coupons, but I think I would if I had it. I'm sure I have before, or at least use a gift card or something. But yeah, I think frugal is just prioritizing value. And so if you're buying shoes, you don't necessarily buy the cheapest shoes. You buy the ones that are going to give you the most value, whether it's how much you like them or whether how long they'll last. And so, for example, like I'd much rather have like one shirt that's cost a hundred bucks that I'm going to wear all the time than like three shirts that cost 20 bucks each that I hate. Even though the cumulative cost is more and the stuff I get is less, I think the value I'm going to get out of it is more because I'm going to like it while I'm wearing it more. It's probably going to last longer. I'm actually going to use it. I'm not going to throw them away or donate. And so I think frugality is just all about focusing on spending money as a tool to get the most value out of things and not spending money on the stuff that doesn't give you a lot of value. And so for me, I, I'm not there on first class yet. You know, like I could, you know, I could just be like, hey, I'm a 6'4 millionaire. Like I, I deserve this. But I was like, I don't know. It just seems like too much money. I, I prioritize my freedom and stuff like that over, over first class. It can mean different things, to different people. But, you know, for example, like I'm a good tipper. I, I think I'm a good tipper. Like it's always at least 20% plus depending on, you know, maybe even big tippers. I like donate 20% of our sales to charity. So I've donated hundreds of thousands of dollars. But I can see that as still being frugal because we're not wasting money on, I don't know, I still wear like free t-shirts and don't burn money. I drive my, my Mazda, nothing, you know, nothing crazy in terms of the stuff I don't find value in. Love it. What Mazda is it? So I was driving a 99 Ford Explorer when I sold my company and like the following year. So I was a millionaire driving a, whatever that was, 15 year old car or something. And then I finally bought my first ever brand new car, which was a 2016 Mazda CX-5, which I still drive. And it's still newer today than any car I'd ever driven in the past. You know, I'd never driven a car this new, even when I bought it, it was older than this. But it is, you know, it's a six-year-old car now. So there's like, you know, I'm eyeing Teslas. I'm deciding if that's, uh, if that's frugal enough <laughs> for me or not. You, you don't even have like CarPlay or things like that in that model. You got to upgrade just to get some of the comforts there. No, honestly, you're right. That's a big one. I, and I think it costs like 400 bucks to like car plays where you can hook up your iPhone and see like maps and stuff. Whenever I get a rental car, I'm like, this is nice, man. Because I can, can see that. <laughs> it's almost like a safety thing too. Because like the map is like closer to your eye line when you're looking yeah. down the road. I should go do that. Yeah, that's great. You're in good company because Spencer has a Mazda. I have a Honda Accord. And so when people are like, why do you drive? I actually had a friend this week ask me like, why do you drive an Accord? I was like, because I like spending my money on other things that I value more. And the Accord's comfortable. It has everything I need. I get a top-of-the-line Accord with a heads-up display and ventilated seats and everything and still be able to invest yeah. a big chunk of my money. So I don't want to waste it on something else. It's not going to break down. Yeah, the Mazda has like no maintenance issues. Like a few like factory recall type things I've taken in for. But yeah, I'll take it. And no one really cares. Everyone's so worried about what th people think about them. No one's worried about what other people are doing. You know, like I look down the street like, oh, what is that parked down in front of me? An Audi? Like, no one gives a shit. Like, you know, everyone's, <laughs> everyone's too worried about if people are thinking about what they're wearing or whatever, you know? Exactly. That's a great lesson for a lot of our younger service members. For the listeners that are young soldiers just out of high school or maybe new officers, what kind of stuff, as they get their first job and have real money, real adult money for the first time, what are some things that you recommend to people just getting started that can really move the needle in their financial future? Yeah. I mean, to young military guys, I don't know, maybe this is a stereotype, but I'm like, don't go borrow a bunch of money or at least a really fancy car. It just seems like transportation and housing are your two biggest things. And if you get into a habit of having a huge car payment, that alone, you know, the average car payment in the US is like almost $600 at this point for a new car. And if you're buying like a big truck, it's, it can be like 900 or 1000 It can be crazy. And for sure, it's tempting if you have this first big paycheck, you're like, oh, I got a thousand bucks a month. Why not? A thousand bucks a month is like, four million dollars at retirement or more you know you could be a multi multi-millionaire if you just save up that thousand bucks for a few months and then buy a used car in cash and then start investing you'll you'll be massively far off you know i'm, I'm kind of saying like two far extremes it's like a thousand dollar f-150 car payment versus a used car but yeah don't get into big monthly car payments i like to think of everything in terms of total amounts instead of payments it's like one of my broke habits versus rich habits, which is I think people who are broke are always thinking in terms of monthly payments. Like what can I afford a month? They're just adding up yeah. all these monthly payments and they're not thinking about the total amounts. And so they're just living this like credit score, debt, monthly payment life. Whereas wealthy people think in terms of total amounts, like how much does this car actually cost and paying cash for it and then saving money and having money in savings. And 
And so, yeah, at the end of the day, it's about those two rules. Shave off some of your income and invest it. And then with the rest, you know, I'm not going to judge how you spend on things that you like, but don't get into the monthly debt cycle. Just save and pay cash for things. And if you do that, if you're 20 and you do that when you're 30, you're going to realize you have like 100 or 200 grand in the bank and all your friends are still broke. And they're going to be like, how'd you do that? And you're like, I just wasn't giving banks all my money every month in terms of a payment. I'm saving money in cash and then investing along the way. We're going to do a little scenario here. Let's pretend you're a young Marine or airman. You're stationed overseas in Germany or Japan. You're making about $3,000 a month, which is about what you were making when you were running your business. We'll say that's after taxes to keep it simple. We'll say half of that $1,500 is your food, your transportation, everything else. And now you've got $1,500 a month to decide what you want to do with whether you invest it, whether you spend it on travel, what would Jeremy, young Jeremy do with $1,500 a month, assuming that healthcare is covered, you've got you know, pretty good job security, you're in the military? Yeah, I mean, that's amazing. If you're bringing home 3000 bucks a month, especially if your housing and food is covered while you're overseas, it's, like a, it's a fantastic opportunity to live frugally. I mean, you can live essentially for nothing other than your stateside expenses or whatever. And so if you can like siphon off a lot of that to investing, then you can become magnificently wealthy. And so I would invest a lot of it, maybe all 1,500, maybe 1,000, maybe 500, no less than 500 for sure. And you know, the first place that you can go if you're in the military is the TSP. Again, we were talking before we started recording. It's, in my opinion, this amazing example of government getting it right. You know, Whatever side of the aisle you may be on, there's plenty of blame to, to spread around. But I feel like the TSP is great. It's a low-cost investment that has a tax advantage that harnesses the power of the companies of the world. And if you just go into your TSP website, you pick one of those L funds, you take your birth year, add 65, round up to the nearest decade, and then drag that slider up and that says how much money you're putting in, it's going to make you a millionaire. That's it. it. It takes like five minutes. And then with the rest of the money coming in, as long as you're not doing like crazy bad stuff like getting into massive debt or gambling or something, you can just spend it however you want. You know, if you're, if you're maxing out your TSP, which this year is $20,500 you can put in, 22000 next year, that's going to easily make you a multimillionaire. And so that's what I would be doing. And if you get started young, time is kind of the most important factor in this compound growth equation. The longer you let it go, the, the, the bigger and bigger this exponential curve gets. And so if you're doing it when you're young, it's a huge advantage. And, you know, unfortunately, I, I hear a lot of times from people who are like, in their 50s or 60s, and they like say, hey, Jeremy, you know, I'm broke now. Finally, I've gone out of debt after paying off my F-150 for the last 30 years. What do I do at 60? I want like the secret because I'm not going to do it the other way. And the secret is there is no secret. You know, you still just have to, you know, the only other way to do it is just put more money in. You know, what could be 500 bucks a month when you're 25 might have to be like 3,000 bucks a month when you're 55. And hopefully your income is bigger then, but, you know, take advantage of those early years and, and invest. Yeah, you can let compounding interest and time do the heavy lifting, whereas the longer you wait, the more you have to do more of the heavy lifting to make up for it. Jeremy, are there any purchases under, let's say, just pick a random $200, any purchases under $200 that you've made that has really impacted your life and allowed you to convert your, your dollars into happiness? The thing that I, I personally like is this like Yeti cup. Actually, I have like a water bottle that's like insulated and I put cold water in it. My favorite drink is like cold water on a hot day. I don't know. It's like one of those things. It's like not worth it in terms of how much metal is in there or whatever. Paying like <laughs> 40 bucks for a water bottle when you could pay like four bucks for a water bottle. But man, just having ice cold water, I feel like that new wave of, I mean, maybe we had them when I was a kid and they're called thermoses or something, but just vacuum insulated water bottles are just have made my life so much better. Oh, that's a great answer. I love that. So you've been very anti-crypto, as far as I can tell, for years, looking you know, through kind of your old posts on your, on your website and on your Instagram. Where did that come from? Were you just upset that you missed the boat and you didn't get Bitcoin when it was $4? To be transparent, if I could go back in time, I would absolutely buy Bitcoin. I'm not, I'm not done. Right? Right. <laughs> I, I, I literally remember learning about it in 2010. And I'm, my background is I have a master's in computer science. So like, I understand the technology. I learned about it in 2010. Bitcoin, I remember this to this day, it was six cents a coin. And I was like, should I buy like a hundred bucks just in case it hits a dollar? I was like, no, nah, you know, a Bitcoin will never be worth a dollar. That's, that's obviously insane. Like why would this <laughs> made up currency be worth what a US dollar is? And of course that hundred dollars, had I done it, would be worth a million today or millions or whatever. Yeah. And so I, I wouldn't say that I'm anti-crypto. I'm just anti-speculation in general. 
you know, I'm as anti-crypto as I am buying pork belly futures or gold or oil. You know, there's this class of stuff that isn't investing. It's just guessing what's going to happen in the future. The allure of the guessing is that crazy things can happen. You can get rich or broke much quicker like you could in Vegas. But the downside is, you know, over long periods of time, it's not the guaranteed path to wealth like index funds and real estate as things that go up in value and pay you while you, while you own them. In, in fact, I have a cleaning person that cleans my house. One of the things I do spend money on, she comes every two weeks. She's been coming for a couple of years now and she kind of started to figure out like what I do here. <laughs> like I'm sitting in my house looking at a camera <laughs> making TikToks all day or whatever. And then so the first financial question she asked me was like, should I be buying crypto? And I'm like, my God, hell no. Like you should be like building an emergency fund and like maxing out your tax advantage retirement accounts and investing in index funds. So when I come off as anti-crypto, sure, it could be part of a healthy portfolio in the same way that like Cocoa Krispies are part of a balanced breakfast. You know, it's only, <laughs> it's only true if you're also like have a glass of milk and a pancake and a, eggs and, and like all the other stuff, you know, but like the core nutritional value alone of Cocoa Krispies should not be relied on for your complete breakfast as shouldn't crypto. And so, yeah, if you're a young or you know, if you're any age military person, you know, I, I have what I call the 90-10 rule with 90% of your portfolio, buy and hold index funds. That's like your TSP, your Roth IRA, index funds go inside of those accounts. And then give yourself permission with 10% to go nuts. That's like the release valve on your FOMO. If you want to buy crypto, go for it. You know, get your TSP cooking. Then with your 10%, day trade, pick stocks, whatever there is, options, you know, do this, all this other nonsense. I can't tell you which things, you know, sometimes people ask me advice for that 10% portion. And I can't tell you which thing is going to do the best there. If I could, I would simply be trading the information and be a billionaire in a yacht off the coast of Fiji eating sushi off ancient Roman artifacts or something. Uh, I don't know, billionaire. <laughs> um, so don't ask me advice on a speculation, but I do know that it can make you broke and it can keep you broke. Because when I talk to someone who's 60, sometimes people knock my investment advice. They're like, they're like oh, index funds, this, you know, I don't want the average return. The market's going to crash. You shouldn't be investing now. Uh, there's a better stock to pick. And, you know, when I, when I dig on, I was like, I was like, hey, like, you know, are you a millionaire, right? It's usually someone's uncle. And I ask if their uncle's a millionaire. And the answer is always like, no, he, you know, he made some money early, then he lost, he made some money, he lost it. And you can keep chasing your tail for 40 years, and then you're broke, still looking for the next hot crypto tip when you're 60. Or you could be a multimillionaire and you're 10%, no matter how it did. Maybe you're a decamillionaire because it went to millions, or maybe you're just a multimillionaire. Either way, you're in a good shape. Uh, yeah, I love that. Love that 90-10 rule. I think that's pretty good. I tend to tell people even less like 5%. And then I'm like, at that point, it's not even worth it. Like you're, like you're, you're, making, these, you're making these home run bets with, especially if you're a young enlisted guy, and all you can afford to invest into your TSP might be three or four, five hundred dollars a month. And so then what? You're going to use your extra 50 bucks to go buy a little bit of Bitcoin? No, man, just go buy some beers with your friends. Like you'll have much better return on investment doing that. Yeah, yeah. The 10% doesn't mean you have to, for sure. If people want to go all in index funds, that's great. But I just think it's like, it's permission for the people who are constantly feeling this FOMO if they want to. But yeah, I buy, I think like a hundred bucks a month in Bitcoin and Ethereum. But again, in context of my portfolio, that's like 0.01%. It's like, you know, I have millions of dollars in index funds and I just have this just almost for like educational purposes. And of course, I've lost over half the money because crypto is down. It might go up, you know, who knows? Like, I don't know what's going to happen. But if it does go up 100x, then at least I'll have something, you know. Uh, Jeremy, I just want to talk before we wrap up here about success a little bit. You sold a business for millions in your 30s. You recently got a blue check mark on Instagram. I mean, those sound to me like some pretty, some pretty big markers of success or traditional markers of success. Did you feel like you made it when you reached those goals? or was there something missing? I mean, first of all, it's funny how <laughs> the two examples you gave were, you made millions of dollars like selling a company you worked on for decades and there's an emoji by your name on Instagram, you know. Or, um, <laughs> Welcome to America, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. But you're right. I like, and whatever, for whatever reason, that blue check mark means something. It's some of both. I can definitely like point to my resume now and be like, hey, I'm tall. You can't take that from me. I'm 6'4", and I sold a company. You can't, like, those, those are both factually true statements. And so when I'm feeling especially depressed or whatever, I was like, that's still true. But also, like, everything is relative, right? There are days where I wake up and still feel like a piece of shit. I was like, all right, well, I don't know how to make good content anymore. Or 
our engagement has been down this year, whether it's because the market's down or, or Instagram's slowly dying or whatever it is, you know, like I'm like, oh man, this whole thing is a bust. You know, I still think that if you're waiting for happiness at the end of the rainbow or whatever, I don't have that recipe. And I think that, you know, if you asked Jeff Bezos or something, I think that he still has bad days too. I, you know, I, I think we have to all remind ourselves that the journey is life. You know, the days that we live are life. And I think that if you're just waiting for something at the end of the rainbow, you're going to find yourself maybe even more depressed because it's not there. And then you think, what have I been doing this all the time? And what am I doing now? So yeah, while I certainly have like a resume with some success, I still, I think, swimming in the same ocean as everyone else of figuring out how to be happy and have purpose and you know live a good life. I do my best, but you know I don't think I'm an authority to say how to win at that. It's interesting, especially if, someone is just getting started on the journey and to hear from someone who's crossed the finish line, like we've talked to Doug Nordman, we've talked to Rich Carey and, and now you and soon Jesse Meekum. And these are people who have achieved financial independence and they always turn around to the, those who are coming up and on their own journey to financial independence. And they say, got to figure out who you are along the way. Because if you get to the finish line and you haven't figured that out, and let's say that you, you work too hard, right? And you lost your family. It's not worth it. It's because you get, you, get, you get to the end of the day and it's literally, it's a number on a screen. And yes, it provides some security and yes, it provides some freedom. But at the end of the day, it's not something that's going to listen to you or to hug you or to be that, that connection that, that we all crave. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, I, I think it's, you can go wrong in both directions. You know, you can be too broke and be stressed and and poor and you know angry about money all life and you can be too focused on money and and find that it, it has cost you in, in relationships and purpose and things like that and so while money is like the focus of my content and, and my business having a number isn't isn't winning at life you know you still have to find your path and your purpose and your and your joy and your relationships and your happiness and health and fitness and all that stuff too it doesn't there's no cheat codes not that i found yet except for permanent life insurance of course <laughs> We'll start the podcast with that quote. <laughs> Someone's going to listen to 30 seconds like, great. Perfect. Right, that's it. Just it. Jeremy, it's been an absolute blast having you on today. Thanks so much for the insight you've provided, the humor, and the way that you present financial education to like-minded people trying to grow their financial independence. And especially for our military families that are out there, they're busting their butts, they're working hard, their families are moving all the time, they're dealing with all the uh, crap that military families do. So thanks for just being another voice where we can turn to and trust someone to give us good insight. And if people want to find more about you, your courses, follow your blog, website, whatever, where, where do you want us to point the listeners to? Thank you for those kind of words. And thank you guys for what you are doing because I'm so glad there are military voices speaking on money because I talk to military people sometimes and I'm like, my God, what an opportunity you have. You know, you have, can keep your cost of living low. You're young, like solid job. But you know, I, I don't have the standing. You know, I, don't, I wasn't in the military. And so I think using your voices is so important. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, but if you want to learn about index funds, you can find me at Personal Finance Club on Instagram, personalfinanceclub.com. We're on all the other social medias too. And if you want to check out that course, we're doing a special discount for the Military Money Manual using coupon code military money. It's usually 79 bucks and it will give you 20 bucks off. So it'll be 59 bucks. So go to personalfinanceclub.com, click course, and then make sure to type in coupon code military money at checkout and it'll save you 20 bucks by the end of the year. And also, by the way, there's a 100% money back guarantee. If you don't like it, just email us and we'll give you all your money back because we're trying to make you millionaires, not sell you junk. And we donate 20% of the sales to charity. It's just, we're trying to do the right thing, you know? That's awesome. Yeah. I love how you've set that up, Jeremy. That's that's awesome. And thank you so much for that discount code. We will get that out to the listeners. And again, that's military money, no spaces. And you can get 20% off if you go to personalfinanceclub.com and sign up for any of Jeremy's courses there. Jeremy, thanks again for coming on the show. We had a great time and hopefully we can get you on the show again in the future. I'd love to come back anytime. Thanks for having me. Wow, that was an awesome episode. I can easily say that Jeremy was one of the best guests that we've ever had on the podcast. Again, we covered a lot on the podcast. I'm not going to do it justice by summarizing with just three bullets, but remember Jeremy's two rules of living below your means and investing early and often. Also, understanding the impact that compounding interest can have on your investment success and 
focusing on not just on the money side, but also the emotional side of FI. And then finally, we covered Jeremy's 90-10 rule where 90% of your funds should be invested in index funds. And then if you want, you can invest 10% into other alternative investments. If you got any questions or feedback, you can message us on Instagram at Military Money Manual or email podcast at militarymoneymanual.com. We love getting questions and messages from our listeners. We appreciate you joining us today. We're grateful for all of you listening. Keep sharing the podcast with your friends, family, and coworkers. Leave us a five-star review on Apple or Spotify, and we'll catch you on the next episode of the Military Money Manual podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Military Money Manual podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. This helps others find the show, and we really appreciate it. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Hey, guys and gals, Spencer here again. Before I let you go, I want to let you know about two things. First, My 100% free course, it's called the Ultimate Military Credit Cards Course, and you can sign up today at militarymoneymanual.com slash UMC3. I've been running this course for over four years now, and we just celebrated our 7,000th graduate. In this course, I walk you through an absolute beginner's guide to travel hacking and opening your first fee-waived credit cards in the military. Again, you can sign up today at militarymoneymanual.com slash UMC3. It's 100% free, no spam, and you can unsubscribe at any time. Second, my book, The Military Money Manual, A Practical Guide to Financial Freedom is available on my website and Amazon today. Head over to shop.militarymoneymanual.com or if you want the Amazon version, search Military Money Manual. This is the book I wish someone had handed me on my first day in the military. In this book, I cover the exact money tactics and investment strategies I used on my path to achieve financial independence while I served in the U.S. Air Force. The book is the best personal finance book specifically for you, whether you're an active duty, guard, reserve, a military spouse, enlisted, or officer. Any ROTC or academy cadet can benefit from the tactical and strategic advice I lay out in the book. But don't just take my word for it. Here's two reviews of the book. Ryan on Goodreads.com wrote, the most comprehensive investing personal finance book specifically written for military members I've read so far. This book should be handed to every new LT at commissioning. Matt on Amazon said, this book is incredibly straightforward, easy to understand, practical, and useful. This book should be on the Commandant's reading list. Thanks, Matt. If you're interested in the book, head over to my website, shop.militarymoneymanual.com. And podcast listeners can use promo code PODCAST to get a special discount on the ebook, audiobook, and hardcover book. You can find the audiobook on Audible, the ebook on Amazon Kindle, and the hardcover book on Amazon. Or again, head over to my website and use promo code PODCAST for a special discount. Thanks for listening.